All right, so we're back. Um, so just, just so everybody's clear on what's going on, so um, you all are going to have a homework assigned uh, on Wednesday. So um, today, probably today and going into next time, we'll finish bolts. And if we haven't finished bolts by Wednesday, we'll be darn close to doing it. Okay. Um, we have two big topics that we need to discuss with bolts. One of them is slip critical bolts, which we'll talk about today. And the other is uh, combined loading. What happens if you have a bolt that's seeing not only shear, but tension as well. You've got to be able to, uh, to handle both. So that's what we're going to talk about for the next couple days. So on homework four, which is going to be your bolted connection homework, there's probably going to be maybe three problems, maybe four problems, something like that, on bolted connection. So, I mean, I know it's been a while since we talked about this, but it is, uh, uh, it is coming. All right, sound good? All right, so let's get into slip critical connections because that's um, sort of where we left off. So let me just sort of spend a little bit of time. Sign-in sheet, thank you. Going over all this. Um, I even was thinking about it a little bit ago, and I completely forgot about it. Thank you. Um, those sign-in sheets passing around. Okay. Um, I spent all this time talking about the exam, and it's been a while since we talked about bolts, and I thought it'd be a good idea to just sort of recap what was going on with bolts. I'm going to start here. Okay, so if you recall, up until now, we really only discussed two limit states associated with bolted connections. We've either discussed bolt shear or bolt bearing. Okay, now they're they're pretty straightforward. Bolt shear, we're talking about the shear or the the bolt shearing in half or snapping in half. And for the plate, we're talking about the plate failing, either the plate or the hole stretching out a little bit, bolt hole localization, or the bolt or the plate literally being tore out. So we have bolt tear out and bolt hole localization. Now for design, so far, it's been pretty straightforward. We determine our load, we determine the shear capacity of one bolt, and then we divide to obtain the, uh, the number of bolts. Pretty simple, okay? Um, we lay out the connection according to minimum spacing, maximum spacing, and, uh, and edge distance requirements. And that does not guarantee that we've met bolt bearing. Uh, we check bolt bearing, and then that's essentially it. I think our last example we did was this. And we had talked about even stuff that gets pretty basic, things like, uh, like, uh, like uh, prime numbers, remember, try, trying to make sure that we're not picking 13 bolts and have some massively long connection. I mean, we, we got 15 bolts, I think, for this connection, so we just did three by five, keep it in a nice uh, tight grid, and then check our bolt bearing later. And then we talked about uh, some other detail-associated issues related to, uh, to splices. Any questions? I know it's been a while since we talked about this, but um, uh, it is coming up. So, everybody good? Okay, so let's talk about a slip critical connection. Now, let me be clear on, on this part right here. So, to design a bearing type connection, you determine the load, get the shear capacity of a bolt, divide to obtain the number of bolts, okay? Designing a slip critical connection uh, is no different, okay? The only difference is, uh, from, from a uh, procedure standpoint, is instead of looking at the shear capacity of a bolt, we're going to be looking at the shear capacity and the slip capacity of a bolt, and we just take the, the minimum one. So the design procedure is very, very similar. Okay. Now, um, slip critical connections are the other, I guess I would say, primary type of connection that we use in steel structures. So bearing type connections, if you recall, a bearing type connection literally requires the bolt to come into bearing with the plate. So you have a hole, you have a bolt, and when I load and shear, the bolt literally loads the plate, like physically comes into contact with the plate. It bears on the plate, hence bearing type connection. Okay. Now, a slip critical connection uh, is a little different. Slip critical connections rely on the friction that develops between what we call fang surfaces um, to safely resist load. Now, fang surfaces, I mean the surface where two plates come into contact. So let me, let's see if everybody can kind of grasp what's going on. I've got plate A, plate B. I put them together. Okay. I have a bolt going in, uh, in between them. Put the nut on this end, and I start tightening them. Okay. Now imagine I've got you know this massively powerful wrench. And I'm really wrenching on that uh, bolt to get that bolt super, super, super tight. What's happening to the plates? 
If I have a bolt going in between them, it's really tight. What's happened to the plates? Squeeze together, right? So much so that I could probably develop a fork in between them, right? Remember that whole uh, concept in statics, or not statics, but physics? Actually, those actually both. Um, remember, you have the uh, the nor or the static force that develops between uh, two planes is a common or a product of the normal force between those two planes and a coefficient of static friction. Remember that? Well, essentially, that that slip critical connections uh, in a nutshell. Now. Um, Critical connections are really meant for, I would say, uh, two primary uh, instances. Number one is fatigue. So the easiest way to describe fatigue is imagine you've got a, uh, uh, let's say you got a lawn mower, you know, one of those push mowers, you know, on your lawn. And there, there's nuts and bolts all over that place, right, in, in one of those. Well, imagine what happens if you have a bolt on there that's very, very loose, or somewhat loose, let's just say. And I start the lawnmower up, and I start mowing the lawn. What do you think is going to happen to that bolt over time? Vibrate off, right? So the lawnmower is going to do, and, and over time, got another sound effect in there, right? I, I, got, I got plenty of them. So um, what's going to happen is over time, that bolt is just going to get loose, and it's going to screw off. Now, what we're talking about are connections that are holding up large-scale structures. We can't have that happen, right? So in a structure where we have um, fatigue considerations, we're going to use slip-critical bolts. Quick question. What type, what's one type of structure do you think that fatigue considerations are going to be an issue? A bridge. bridge has cyclic loading. It sees loads over and over and over again. Now, it's not like the lawnmower where all the vibrations are happening over a very short period of time. Bridges are seeing cyclic loads. It's just drawn out over years and years and years. It's not vibrating as fast. It's not really, I mean, we're not talking about vibration, but it is seeing cyclic loading over an extended period of time. So we have to ensure that those connections are, are, are super, super uh, tight just to facilitate uh, its uh, performance throughout its design life. That's one instance. Another is earthquakes. Now, earthquakes, I, I hesitate to say that you design all earthquake-related connections as slip-critical, um, more often than not, you're detailing them uh, as such. In other words, you're, you're drafting out the, the connections and, and constructing it so that it's slip-critical, but you actually don't have to pick uh, that many bolts. Um, usually, the difference between a connection that is designed as a bearing connection and a connection that is designed as a, as a slip-critical connection is that slip-critical connections, by and large, you need twice as many bolts because you're not able to develop as much force between, uh, between the, those plates than you are if you were just trying to snap that bolt in half. Um, in other words, if I'm, if I'm in the lab and I got two plates sandwiched together and I got a slip critical bolt and I yank on it, um, I'm probably going to fail that frictional uh, force before I fail the bolt. Does, does that make sense? And I can only get so much friction, um, so it, it's a little weaker uh, in that regard. All right, sound good? Yes. Sir. When the frictional force fails, so here, here's what happens in the lab, okay? So uh, you've got plate A and plate B, put them together, stick a bolt through them, tighten them up, right? And you've got them really tight, okay? And you start loading it, okay? Now what happens first is you're going to fail that frictional force before the bolt comes into contact with the, the plate. In other words, here's the, the, here's the hole. And the bolt is just sort of sitting there. It's not coming into contact, right? It's sitting there, and the plates are, the friction's holding it there. Once you fail that frictional force, it goes like that. And if you're in the lab, you'll hear a boom, like a big boom, because it suddenly comes into contact. But then, as soon as it comes into contact, it stops becoming a slip critical connection, and it starts becoming a bearing. I'm not saying the connection is going to fail. What I'm saying is that it stops doing what we're intended, intending it to do, because then there's no more friction. Does that make sense? Everybody else okay with that? Yes, sir. True, true. Um, but that, but I, I see where you're getting at. Uh, you, what I'm saying is that um, in an earthquake. 
the forces that we're seeing due to an earthquake are far larger than what we're seeing uh, in wind. Okay? The concern you're raising is about, well, if you've got a really, really tall building, you're going to get massive, massive wind forces. What I'm saying is that in that scenario, you're just going to use more bolts. That doesn't necessarily mean you're going to use slip critical bolts. Okay? Slip critical bolts, that's a different story. Okay? Does that make sense? Is that, is that a fair way of answering that? I, again, in, I'm not saying you don't have a lot of force. I'm just saying you might not always use slip critical connections to resist that force. Fair answer? Fair good? Yeah, everybody good? <laughs> All right. So again, the, the theory is pretty simple. Um, uh, frictional force, or a coefficient of static friction times normal force. So it stands to reason that the amount of force that you develop between two plates is a function of the coefficient of friction, so the surface, so steel on steel, what's that coefficient of friction, and the normal force. In other words, um, it might have something to do with how tight the bolt is. You know, what does that mean? I mean, in other words, if, if you're using a wrench versus if you're using a wrench, you might have bolts that are at different levels of tightness. See what I mean? So, um, to achieve this normal force, we have Two, we, have, we have really a two-step process. So we get the bolts snug tight. Now, now I say snug tight, and, and what, what is snug tight? Here's what snug tight is. Snug tight is either um, a few hits of the impact wrench or basically the full effort of a given iron worker to get that uh, connection snugged in. There's no real super codified definition on, on what snug tight is. The reason why is because that doesn't really matter. Once you get the bolt snug tight, you've got to use one of the prescribed methods to achieve the, uh, the required torque. Now, what are those prescribed methods? Okay, there's a, num a number of them. Okay, um, I'm going to show you a, a video. I think I can. I think I have a copy of it uh, on the uh, uh, on the V drive. But one of them is called the turn of the nut method. This is probably one of the most common ones because it doesn't really require any super specialized equipment. Some of the others, uh, they require um, the equipment that you use is, is a little more specialized. But you can do things like using a calibrated wrench, in other words, a special wrench that is calibrated to uh, uh, produce the required amount of torque. You can use special type of bolts, twist off uh, tension control bolts, that's one of them. You can also use a, a direct tension indicator. A direct tension indicator is basically a fancy washer. Has these little nubs on it. When the nubs mash to a certain uh, certain level, you know you've uh, hit your required tension. Um, everybody with me so far? All right. Let me tell. Let me show you this uh, turn of the nut uh, methodology. So um, I think the easiest way is I have a slide on it, but I think the easiest way is let me see if I've got this video. I do not. So I think it's on YouTube. I will try and find it, and if I can't find it, we'll just move on. Ah, this is this. Okay. We're going to have to change that to... Okay, that didn't work. What? No, I know, but I should hear a little... See? There we go. All right. So this fabricator is, is working to install uh, these particular bolts using, uh, bolts using a slip critical methodology. The, the first thing that he's doing is he's getting the bolts snug tight. So it's just a few hits of the, uh, the, uh, the impact wrench. Now, if you notice, what he's doing is he's marking the bolt and he's marking uh, the nut. So the idea is once he does that, that, that prescribed turn, he'll be able to visually see, okay, this is how much that, that needs to turn. And that, that wrench he's using is really just a, it's just a really powerful uh, 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 wrench. You can see it's just sort of, there you go. That's basically it. See, if you notice, he's got this uh, sort of red guide on there that's helping him uh, line up, you know, how much that needs to turn. And, and it's really just a lookup. You go to uh, the RCS and say, all right, here's my bolt diameter, group A or group B. I need to turn it an extra third of a turn or half of a turn. That's it. <laughs> That's basically all there is to it. 
Yeah. It's grabbing. But it's it's grabbing and turning. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So, for instance, for this example, oh, I want to go back to this. So, for instance, for this example, um, that particular bolt needed to be turned a third of a turn past um, past uh, snug tight. So, if you notice, you can see here is the mark that was placed on the bolt, and there was one on the nut right here. And then that wrench basically just yanked on it until it got that third of a turn, and then that's uh, prescribed tension. It's one of the easiest methods uh, that's used. If you go to a, uh, a fabricator and you see a bridge splice, once it's done, uh, if you look in the field, like once it's done, you'll see these little paint marks all over the place. That's what they were for. They were there to get those bolts uh, to their prescribed, uh, prescribed torque. Sound good? Uh, this is one way, and I would argue this is the simplest way because um, uh, they're one sixteenth of an inch. That, no, 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 no. That that that's that's. Oh, oh. Um, that's a good question. So. Um, we're talking about, when I say oversized or, or slotted holes, I'm talking about things like on a bridge where you have an expansion bearing. So maybe to allow a little bit of uh, potential movement, you might have a slotted hole. More often than not, in most, most structures, uh, we try not to use them. So. I mean, they, they have their uses here and there, but... Yeah. That is all that is correct. No, I, I just I don't understand what the question is. No, 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 no. Remember, we don't put a half-inch diameter bolt in a half-inch diameter hole. You couldn't do that anyways. That's why we drill the hole a, a little bit larger. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, I know. Oh, oh. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. This is one. one. All right. You have plate A and plate B coming in contact with one another. So they've got a lot of force in between them. Now, you grab this plate and I grab this plate and we do that, okay? The friction keeps it together, but only for a certain point and then it slips. Does that make sense? What? Yes. Yes, yes. I mean, like, literally, that's what I'm talking about. That's what slips. So does that, I mean, does that make sense? Is everybody else okay with that? Yeah. I, wait, wait, the hole in the plate. The hole is in the plate. They, they are. I'm not talking like like a bolt a bolt hole that's like four inches larger than the bolt. I'm talking like a sixteenth of an inch. Actually, well, yeah, one third. Yeah, it, it, we're not. I mean, you're, it, it's going to be. Well, it's loud. Do, do, but do you want it to be dramatic? Maybe. <laughs> all right, all right, all right, all right, all right. Okay, okay. 
Now, um, a couple things, a couple other methodologies. Um, uh, one of them is the use of a calibrated wrench. And um, uh, you can use a wrench that's calibrated to use a very specific torque. The way that you calibrate them is you basically stick a bolt inside of this thing right here. This thing is called a, a Skidmore Wilhelm. And if you want a, a definition for what it is, it's basically a super duper hyper accurate bathroom scale for bolts. So you put a bolt in, you tighten it, and then it measures the force. So you use a wrench and then you say, okay, I'm gonna be installing three quarter inch diameter bolts all day. So you, you use it on that machine and that machine is basically reading like a bathroom scale and it will tell you when to stop based on a prescribed torque to reach that, um, that given tension. That's basically it, it it's, it's pretty straightforward. There are some other niftier systems out there. This is one that's probably a little more expensive, but I would argue is much easier to install. So this is a twist-off control bolt. Um, you have a, it, it involves the use of a special wrench and a special bolt. So if you notice, the bolt kind of has this sort of splined end. See how you've got the threads, but see how there's this kind of end right here with this little nub on it? Does everybody kind of see that? So what happens is you use this specialized wrench, and the wrench grabs not only the, uh, the nut, but it grabs this little splined in, and it starts tightening, okay? Once it reaches that prescribed tension, the splined in actually just sort of breaks off. So it's really easy for an inspector to come out and say, all right, here's this connection. This one still needs to be tightened. This one still needs to be tightened. These two are good because it broke off. It's very fast uh, to install, also a little expensive. So, which is more important, time or money? Well, it's a trade-off. It just depends on what you're working on. Sound good? You're exactly right. We're actually going to talk about that here in a little bit. But the inconsistencies are actually, they actually work more in our favor than they do against us. Okay. More often than not, what you find in the field is the amount of torque that we rely on versus the amount of torque we actually get. We actually get a whole lot more, so much more that the amount of torque that we rely on, we actually bump it up 13% because statistically, that's how, I mean, people tend to wrench on bolts like crazy. I guess it's just sort of common practice. Sound good? All right. Um, the last one I think is worth mentioning is a direct tension indicator. A direct tension indicator is, um, is really just a very special washer. The idea is that you have these gauges that will measure the, uh, the distance between, um, uh, the distance between you know, this gap right here. So before and after tightening, those little nubs on that washer will mash down. And once they've mashed down a particular distance, you've hit your, uh, your specified uh, torque. Um, there's, there, there are all sorts of specialized ones. Like there's ones that have, like there's these washers and they kind of have these little grooves in them. And they have this like, sort of like this orange goop that's inside it. And then once you start tightening it, those nubs mash down and the orange goop starts to squirt out. So if you're tightening, as soon as you see the orange goop squirting out, you're like, all right, I'm good. So there's a, there's a whole industry with, you know, with, with trying to achieve this. So, so yeah. All right. Sound good? Okay, all right, so let me explain how we determine nominal capacity. Now, one thing that's kind of strange is that our fee factor is one, and that's probably a, an odd one for us. This is one of the few instances that we will actually use a fee factor of one. The reason why we use a fee factor uh, of one is because if a member or a connection fails in slip, it sucks, but it's no big deal because the bolt can still take over. Okay, so it's not as much of a drastic concern as if we're talking about bolt shear failure. I mean, if we talk about bolt shear failure, the bolt is literally snapping in half. This is just a failure of friction, so it's not as big of a deal. All right, now, this equation's got a lot more going on, but it really is just coefficient of friction times normal force times a few adjustment factors. So number one, mu, our mean slip coefficient. That's the coefficient of static friction. Okay, T sub B, this minimum fastener tension, that's the normal force. That's how much tension is inside the bolt. I mean, think, what's, think about what's happening. If I take plate A, plate B, stick a bolt through them, and start tightening the bolt, the plates are mashing together. But what do you think is happening to the bolt? 
but both wanting to stretch out. It's wanting to get longer. Does that make sense? So the way that we go about this is we try and achieve a given uh, fastener tension inside the bolt. Now, D sub U, this is an adjustment factor. This is 1.13. I'll talk about that here in a second. Um, we have H sub F, which is a filler plate factor, and we also have the, uh, the number of slip planes. I'll talk about each of these. All right. Everybody good so far? All right. So number one, mu. So mu is our coefficient of static friction. Um, this is essentially going to be a function of the surfaces of the steel. In other words, we're getting friction by having steel come into contact with steel. Okay? So um, mo more often than not, we're going to be dealing with a class A surface, which is just regular old steel coming into contact with regular old steel. So our mu, we take our coefficient of static friction to be 0.3. But if we need more frictional force, we could actually use something like a sandblaster and actually blast clean the two surfaces of steel and get a little bit of benefit. If we do that, we get a coefficient of static friction of 0.5. So a higher coefficient of static friction means a stronger bolt in, in, in slip critical capacity. But more often than not, we're just going to go with, uh, with 0.3. And unless we state otherwise, 0.3 is what we go off of. Sound good? Yes, sir. Well, yeah, I mean, let me say this. So properly installed, I mean, you're taking a plate and plate and sandwiching them together. So first off, when you're bolting it together, the steel's brand new, so it shouldn't be fairly rusty, okay? And if you're developing thousands and thousands of pounds between these two plates, you shouldn't get much water in there anyways. You see what I mean? So I would say no, it doesn't. Sound good? All right. Um, okay, D sub U. Now, D sub U is 1.13, and let me explain what's going on. This is what I was mentioning earlier. The, um, the amount of torque that you get in the field is actually a lot higher than what we actually specify, so much so that you can actually um, collect the data and see. I mean, by and large, the, the lower bound um, value that we can rely on is 1.13. In other words, on a lower bound average, bolts are seeing about 13% more tension than they really need to. So we count on that. Now, if you're the engineer of record on a job and you go through it and, and, or you work at a fabricator and you know that your crew is going to be installing bolts that are 20% larger, you could use 20, uh, 1.2 if you wanted. I don't think that's very uh, uh, common. I think that's a pretty rare occurrence. More often than not, everybody's just going to go with the, uh, the, the 1.13. So it's the ratio of the pretension specified versus the pretension we actually see in the field. Sound good? All right. Um, T sub B, now that is the minimum bolt pretension. It's in a table in the spec, but we're ultimately not going to need to refer to it. By and large, the, ratio, or the, the relationship's pretty simple. The bigger the bolt, the more tension, or the more tension we need to develop a, a slip critical connection. And it's roughly about 70% of the tensile strength of the bolt. It's not always, but it, by and large, that's about what it is. Um, now, H sub F, that is a filler plate factor. For most cases, we're going to take that to be one. But the idea behind a filler plate is, okay, so I have member A, and I'm splicing it to member B. If they've got different depths, I've got to have a filler plate in there to make up the difference. But if I use a whole bunch of filler plates, well, it stands to reason if I'm trying to sandwich together five or six different plates, I may not be able to get as much friction than if I was only trying to sandwich together two plates. So a whole bunch of plates, we end up using a, a different hiller, uh, filler plate factor. But we aren't going to deal with that. Uh, and in most cases, you try and avoid that in fabrication anyways. So we're going to take that to, uh, uh, to be uh, one. Last one is N sub S, but N sub S is just the number of shear planes. Just like it's the, I mean, the number of shear planes and the number of slip planes are the same thing, you know? So more, uh, more slip planes equals more friction. So one of the things to point out is go to your table 7-1. Go to the bolt table, all right? Hopefully you've got that tabbed. So if you go to table 7-1, table 7-1 will tell you what the available shear strength of bolts are, okay? Now watch this. Is everybody with me on here? Table 7-1? Now turn the page. 7-3. They're right there. That's insane, isn't it? 
So if you look at table 7-3, there's one on the left side of the page and one on the right side of the page. What's the difference between the one on the left and the one on the right? Group A and group B bolt. Okay, so it's right there. What, are, what fame surface is both tables assuming? Class A. So it's bo they're both assuming Class A fang surfaces. So it's pretty straightforward. You got a single slip or double slip, single shear, double shear, standard size hole, three quarter inch diameter bolt. You can look up your slip capacity. It's that simple. Okay. Pretty straightforward stuff, right? Not too complicated. So we're gonna when we come back, uh, we're gonna design this particular connection. As, it, as if it is a slip critical connection, um, it won't be much different than if it was a, uh, uh, a bearing type connection. And then the last thing we'll look at is combined loading. Sound good? All right, that's all I got. Uh, for those of you not in concrete, I'll see you next time. Otherwise, I'll see you in a few minutes.